In the previous video, what is an inductor part one? I compared an inductor to a capacitor. Let's continue doing that. On the left side, I have the equation for the capacitor that we talked about in a previous video. On the right side, I have the approximate equation for a coil wound inductor. The thing to note is that for the capacitor, the epsilon is a property of the material between the plates. The A is the area of the plates. The D is the distance between the plates. The A and D depend on the geometry of the capacitor. And the epsilon depends on the material between the plates. A similar thing occurs in the inductor. Instead of epsilon, there's this quantity mu. It uses the Greek letter mu. And this is called permeability. And it's a property of the material inside of the coil. These other terms are like the capacitor, but th th their properties of the geometry of the inductor. The n is the number of turns. So if I look at this inductor, it looks like that's about a little over two turns. So the number of turns gets squared, and that's multiplied by the cross-sectional area of this inductor, which would be the area inside of this coil. So it would be this area here of the coil. The L is the length of the inductor, which would be this dimension. The one thing that's very interesting to me is that the property epsilon and the property mu are very fundamental to nature. Let's just talk about that a little bit. If we take the quantity mu of free space, I'll call it mu sub zero, we multiply it by epsilon of free space. I'll call that epsilon sub zero. We take the square root and divide that into one. And if we calculate the value, it turns out that this is equal to the speed of light, which I'll call c prime so we don't confuse the c with the speed of light with the C of capacitance. Now remember Einstein's famous equation, E equals mass times the speed of light squared, E equals mc squared. So if we substitute the speed of light squared in terms of mu zero and epsilon zero, we can rewrite Einstein's famous equation. E equals m divided by mu zero times epsilon zero. So we see that mu and epsilon are very fundamental to the world we live in. When we compare the properties of the inductor and the capacitor, we find that a lot of the properties are kind of interchanged like voltage in the capacitor kind of corresponds to current in the inductor. So let's consider what would happen if we connect a capacitor and an inductor together in parallel. So let's say that we have a capacitor and we have a, a switch that's open. That switch connects to an inductor and this inductor connects back to our capacitor and we'll call this point our ground. Let's presume that this capacitor is charged, initially charged. And let's presume it's charged to 5 volts. And this switch is open. So the voltage on the inductor, let's call it V, is initially at ground. There's no current flowing in the inductor. So let's consider what happens when we close this switch. 
and let's let's make a graph of the voltage across the inductor versus time. And this axis here is the voltage. At this this point at the origin. At this point, the switch is closed. So the voltage across the inductor is zero. Then all of a sudden, we close the switch, and it jumps up to five volts. So we have five volts across the inductor. So remember that when we apply voltage across an inductor, the current sort of ramps up. And the inductor will resist change in current. So the current won't change instantly. So the current will start to ramp up. Oh, but when that happens, the capacitor will discharge. So the current here is increasing slowly. So as this current starts to ramp up, our capacitor discharges. So the voltage comes down. And the, the current goes up. This, this curve here is voltage. This other curve is current. So the current increases. But what happens when the, the voltage here is, is zero across the inductor, but the inductor will resist current change. So this current tries to stay constant. And when it does that, the capacitor starts discharging in the other direction. So we find that the voltage does this. And the thing to observe here is remember that the current in the inductor is related to the voltage across the inductor. It's related to how this area builds up. So we start with zero area. And as we move to the right, the area increases, so the current increases. And here, this area is, is below the curve. In fact, this voltage here is minus 5 volts. The voltage here is plus 5 volts. So when the area above the curve is equal to the area below the curve, the current has to be zero at this point. So our current decreases and becomes zero. And this curve just continues. It we can it just keeps continuing back and forth. And the current will again become zero here because the area of this section is equal to the area of this section. Not exactly drawn to scale, but approximately. So when we connect a capacitor in parallel with an inductor, we get a circuit where the voltage just keeps oscillating back and forth. It turns out that the one period of this oscillation, if we measure here to here, it's 2 pi times the square root of the inductance multiplied times the capacitance. So that's called the period of the cycle. Now in a real circuit, there's going to be a certain amount of parasitic resistance. You just can't avoid that. So this, this circuit will not oscillate forever. The resistance will kind of damp it out. And these waveforms over time will decrease and eventually the oscillations will, will stop. The inductor also has another very interesting property that I call kickback. So let's explore that. Let's presume we have a battery. And this battery is 5 volts. And we connect the battery to a switch. On the other side of the switch, we have an inductor connected back to the battery. 
and we'll call this point at the bottom of the battery, call it ground. Let's say that at time zero, I close this switch. Let's analyze the voltage V across the inductor. So let's make a horizontal time scale. And we'll plot voltage in this direction, V. We'll call this time zero. So at time zero, I close the switch. So previous to that, there's no voltage on the inductor. I close the switch and I apply the battery voltage to the inductor, which is 5 volts. So it stays 5 volts. And let's presume that at some point in time, I open the switch. So at this point, I open open the switch, I'll call SW, SW for switch. So when I open the switch, the current in the inductor stops. There's no, there's no path for the, the current to flow. But remember that an inductor resists change in current. So what's going to happen if I open the switch suddenly? And all of a sudden, I have a large current that has, has built up in the inductor, and I, I tell it to stop right away. What's going to happen is that the, the voltage in the inductor is going to reverse. It has to stop the current, so it's going to reverse. But it's going to, there's nothing much to limit that voltage, so it's going to keep reversing and come way down here. I call that kickback, and it'll come back up, something like this. So what, what happens is that the, that this, the current in the inductor is proportional to this area. So the, let me change color. So the current is ramping up at this time. And all of a sudden I open the switch and the current wants to go to zero. And to do that, it has to equalize the area of this voltage above the horizontal line to this area. When these two areas become equal, at that time, the current will go to zero. So when these areas are equal, the current will start falling down. In reality, this current can't drop instantly. There's always some parasitics in this circuit. There's parasitic capacitance in these windings. I'll draw here. So it's always a little bit of parasitic. So the voltage won't go to infinity, but it'll, it'll become very large. And this voltage could even be potentially dangerous. For example, have you ever had your toaster on and you, you pl unplug the AC outlet when your toaster is still on. And that toaster has a little bit of inductance. And you notice that when that toaster was unplugged, you got a spark. And that's, uh, that can be very dangerous. And you don't want to do that. You always want to turn off your toaster or turn off your appliance before you remove the AC cord from the outlet to avoid this strong inductor kickback.